Unfortunately, in the world we live in, credentials do not mean everything. If they did mean everything, every PT that is qualified to be a PT would be a fantastic PT. But unfortunately, the reality is, most of them, I would say, are probably not so fantastic. Firstly, before we go into the video, I just want to say a very quick thank you. Obviously, the last video did cover a very serious topic, and I just want to thank you so much for the positive and supportive response from that. I don't just mean on the YouTube and in the comment section, because as you know, I read all the comments, but also on Instagram, in which people are sharing things and tagging their stories, things like that I really do appreciate. So again, thank you so much. Sadly, there is more to be done regarding the issue, not just when looking at Brett and Ryan, but also other creators within the industry and other individuals within the industry as a whole. Together, we can work towards tackling the issue and hopefully overcoming it. I say today's gonna be a bit of a different video in nearly every video. Can it really be a bit of a different video if I say it in every video? The answer is probably not. So today's gonna be more of an informative video. So hopefully you're looking for some good source because I'm gonna provide you with what I believe to be, in my opinion, good source. As a video that was recently done by Erin Stern and that's the best exercises for quads, full workout to grow your quads. And we're gonna discuss some things. But before we do so, what must be done, must be done. If you like the video, please let me know you like the video by dropping a like on the video. 1200 likes in the first 24 hours is the goal, so we'll shoot for that. If at any point throughout this video you learn something or take something away from it, I'd really appreciate it if you did consider clicking the red button down below and subscribing to the channel and maybe even the bell next to it so you get notified when I upload every week, twice a week. And if you have a question you want me to answer at the end of the next video drop it down below for comment question of the week and i should do so as it's an informative video i'm gonna put on a hat that looks serious i feel like a teacher might wear this it actually doesn't fill my head whatsoever i feel like my head's gonna pop all right so update my head has grown at least something has crazy i look like a train conductor huh i like it all right so this is not gonna work all right this is gonna have to do because it is it's too tight to wear on my big head before we start the video every time i've ever brought up erin's videos or maybe mentioned her information her input the go-to comment is always, oh, I'm sorry, how many Olympias have you won? And I'll actually tell you the answer to that, uh, none. Unfortunately, in the world we live in, credentials do not mean everything. If they did mean everything, every PT that is qualified to be a PT would be a fantastic PT. But unfortunately, the reality is, most of them, I would say, are probably not so fantastic. Unfortunately, there are also some individuals within the industry with PhDs pushing some, some utter nonsense. But I shall be doing a video covering that soon. Don't you worry about that. And I'm sure a few of you may know who I'm going to talk about. That's that out of the way. So now we're going to crack on with the best exercises for quads. The foundation of building beautiful quads really comes down to proper exercise selection along with those compound movements. When looking at building muscle, exercise selection is extremely important as are compound movements. So I fully back that. That's a big yes. Thank you. Our first exercise is the Spanish squat. If you've never done this exercise before, this is not only fantastic for building quads, but it's great for improving overall knee health. The Spanish squat isn't a movement I would necessarily incorporate for hypertrophy benefits, so the building of the muscle. Although I have heard, again, I've never implemented it personally, but I've seen a lot of creators like Squat University speak about how great it can be for knee health. If you are having knee troubles, whatever that may be, implementing the Spanish squat as part of your, your workout regime may be a good idea. But again, that very much depends on the troubles you are having. I just got a drink and the water splash into my eyeball. I feel like I've just gone swimming. Moving on to our next exercise, this is a front squat. You want the bar to rest across the clavicle and you want the bar to also rest in the divot of the shoulder. Things like front squat and like the goblet squat are what we kind of consider anterior loaded or anterior loading movements in which the weight is very much placed in front of you, so anterior, rather than behind you like a back squat would be, etc, etc. And because of the loading of this, i.e. the weight being here, other things are going to fail before your quads do, which then limits your ability to take your quads to if not close to failure which is ultimately what we kind of want to do when looking at hypertrophy and building the quad muscles by that i mean is realistically when you're front squatting let's say you're doing a set to failure your core will probably give out first your serratus may give out first your shoulders may give out first your arms may give out first your upper back may give out first all these areas that you don't want to give out will likely give out before your quads limiting your ability to train your quads effectively so now i'm not saying the front squat and like the goblet squat are bad movements but when considering purely quad hypertrophy i personally would would probably not implement them as part of my training program. This can be mostly a quad exercise by taking it nice and slow. 
keeping that upper body nice and tall, elbows up. Depth isn't really there. As you can see, Erin's kind of quite shy regarding depth there. Oftentimes when you do like a high bar squat, like a front squat or something similar, it is often a bit easier to, to hit depth. And you see Erin's hip crease is above the top of the knee. Again, I'm not saying you have to go below that, but that's usually why I typically deem to be like an in-depth squat where you're hip creases below the top of the knee. Another thing is she mentioned about how you want to take it slow to essentially feel the quads or something along those lines. This kind of comes down to one of the issues I have with people who place too much emphasis on mind muscle connection. Slowing down the movement and essentially enhancing mind muscle connection is not what we would typically do to place greater bias on a muscle or a muscle group. So for example, do your front squat and slowing it down so you can feel the quads more. Well, in theory, if you slow it down and then spend more time or effort contracting a certain muscle, you could feel any muscle more. It doesn't mean you're necessarily working it more and that's where I think a lot of people fall into the trap of it just because you feel it more just because it's hurting doesn't necessarily mean it's working more when in reality if you want to better bias a muscle when doing a movement you change the mechanics of the movement so for example with a front squat if I wanted to place greater emphasis on the quads and make it more quad dominant instead of slowing it down and squeezing the quads more I would then change it around so knee flexion increases so how much your knee is bending increases which means the quads are getting lengthened further thus going through a greater range of motion and to do that I would maybe elevate the heels so you're on like a platform or use Olympic lifting shoes something along those lines which will then allow you to get deeper knees to travel further quads to lengthen further greater range of motion more emphasis and greater bias on the quads this is why I really don't like people placing mass amounts of value on mind muscle connection I'm not saying it's absolutely useless not at all I'm merely saying I think too many people place too much importance on it when you lift more and more and the weights get heavier and heavier you almost use less resources focusing on sensation and more resources focusing on shifting the movements and the mechanics of the movement itself. Before anyone pipes up saying, oh, Harry, you're saying my muscle connection is trash. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying too many people place too much importance and emphasis on it when there are better things to focus on and better things to measure when gauging progression and muscle growth, such as increasing mechanical tension, progressive overload, etc., etc. Building muscle is largely signal driven, meaning to build muscle, you should do more i.e. progressively overload. Be that volume or weight, so an extra rep, an extra set, a heavier weight, things along those lines. Just every week you should be trying to do more if you can. Knees are always going to follow the direction of the toes too. Knees following the direction of the toes is definitely a big yes. So whichever direction your toes are pointed, be that straight, slightly out, whatever, your knees should follow. Next, we're moving on to the hack squat. And here you wanna think about, again, pushing the weight through the toes. I'm not a massive fan of the toe cue personally. With any squat variation, I always try and make sure my weight is evenly distributed across the foot. So I think big toe, little toe heel, a triangle of pressure to help me distribute the weight across the middle of my foot, thus even distribution across the foot. But the hack squat is a fantastic movement. At the end of the video, I'm gonna go through my, my favorite and kind of top quad movements, which very much aligns with Common Quest for the week. So go nice and slow, especially on that negative or eccentric portion of the rep. I think for the majority of movements, control the eccentric, so the way down, nice and slow. Maybe pause at the bottom if you want to, but you don't have to, and then explode on the concentric. So try and get from the stretch position to the contracted position so bottom to top here as quickly as you possibly can big yes i respect that you want your glutes to stay against that pad great cue there a lot of times when i see people hack squatting their lower back starts coming off the pad don't want that we want your your lower back to be pressed against the pad at all times so please remember that and you really want to think about exhaling on the way up inhaling on the way down. So what I like to do with any kind of squat variation is treat it like I'm going underwater. And I actually got this tip from Squat University. So let's say you do a hat squat or a barbell squat. You take a big breath in as if you're going underwater. You go underwater, I do the rep. And when you finish the rep, i.e. you come out of the water, you breathe out. And here's an exercise where since you're immobilized, you're being stabilized by the machine, look down and watch those quads work. You can also take a free hand and feel the quads working. To us, I, I personally would not feel my quads working if I were doing any variation like this. I would make sure my hands are where the hands are meant to be, i.e. on the pad, on the handles, wherever it may be, pulling down, locking myself in and ensuring I am fully tight throughout my body and locked in ready for the set. Don't feel your quads. It's not gonna increase the effectiveness of the movement. If anything, it may actually decrease effectiveness because you are not able to remain as tight, therefore maybe not able to lift as much weight or your technique may be compromised. Next exercise, we have quad step ups. 
Now here I'm using 10 pound plates. I don't think the step up is a bad movement whatsoever. But a couple of things to address is first of all, I don't like the soft bench here because I think that can really throw off your stability. If you are gonna do a step up, you'd almost rather a hard platform that won't give. If you're doing this for the purpose of biasing the quads, the big thing you want to look at is essentially the range of motion and knee flexion. So how much your knee is bending essentially, which also means how far your knee is traveling. When you're doing things like the step up, as you'll see, the range of motion is quite limited. So you're not really effectively working the quad in a lengthened position. And by that, I mean like a, a deep squat position. Nor are you really effectively working in a shortened position. And because of that, I think that limits the effectiveness of the exercise for the muscles we're trying to target. I do feel like for quad hypertrophy, it's probably not one I would include it can be really helpful to start with that non-dominant side first. Yeah, that's a really good tip actually. I kind of mentioned this a few videos back, but when doing unilateral work, so one side at a time, I would always start with the weaker side first. And that will essentially tell you how many reps you can do on the stronger side. It can help prevent imbalances or maybe sometimes even help correct imbalances over time. The way to make this movement more effective for the quads would essentially be to increase the range of motion. So bump up the height of the step significantly. So you're getting a really deep stretch at the bottom, but obviously again, within range of motion limitations, and you're allowing the knee to bend a lot more, thus take it through a more lengthened position. Moving on, of course, we have leg extensions, but we're gonna do a little something different. We're gonna do an isometric hold at the top. Bloody fantastic movement for the quads, 100%. There are a couple of things I really like about the leg extension. This very much allows you to work the quads in a shortened position. And by that, I mean that the majority of the tension is coming at the contraction. And when we say lengthened position, we mean the stretch. When we say shortened position, we mean the contraction. So when you're, you're tensing, this is when you've locked out essentially. And I can't think of any other movements that allow you to shorten the quads as effectively as a leg extension does. And I think when building an effective program, I think you should likely include movements that place dominance on the lengthened position and the shortened position. Erin also said about iso hold. When I am doing shortened position dominant movements like this, I do make sure to place a bit of additional emphasis on holding the contraction. So doing these iso holds for one to two seconds at the top of each rep, just making sure you're spending more time in that shortened position, which is the, the dominant portion of this movement, we'll say. So JPG actually taught me this on the old TikTok machine. If you lean forward slightly, so hinge at the hips, it can then allow you to shorten the quads even further. Lean forward slightly to make it a bit harder and shorten the quads a bit further. Lean back like Erin is doing here to make it a bit easier. All right, we have our finisher here. This is a, this is called 21s. So we're going to do seven partial reps at the bottom. Then we're going to do seven partial reps at the top. And then we're going to do seven full reps. Sure, 21s do have a time and place and you can do them on most movements if you want to. But personally, when looking at like maximizing quad hypertrophy, I would rather replace 21s with another quote unquote normal movement that you could better progressively overload. So a couple of things I want to address is let's actually talk about the, the volume, the sets and the reps. So in total, we've got 17 sets for our quad dominant workout. And to us, I would say that is excessive. It's nice as a variety of reps. I'm not really a big fan of three by 10. I'd rather arrange because realistically, if you're going two, if not close to failure, you're gonna find it really hard to match three sets of 10 throughout. What I would do is implement more of a range like 10 to 15, eight to 12, things along those lines. But provided we're kind of in the five to 30 rep range, that, that's kind of where we want to be for hypertrophy. Sets, I don't really ever tickle four sets on anything. It's rare if I ever do. My sets are usually two to three. I think the way I would structure it is like this. Choose about five or six exercises per day. I'd make sure I'm hitting each muscle group at least twice a week, probably less frequently for the bigger muscle groups, like the quads, for example, I might hit twice a week. Whereas for the smaller muscle groups, you could probably justify hitting them a bit more frequently, but with lower volume. So let's say like calves, you could maybe do three times a week if you want to do, just things along those lines. I'd have this as a quad dominant lower day, where let's say I choose five Five exercises three of those would be quad dominant now i have one hamstring movement and one glute movement in there and then my next leg day it will be more posterior chain dominant where it'll be primarily hamstrings and glutes with maybe one quad movement or maybe two quad movements in there sets would be about two to three sets per movement totaling let's say roughly about let's say 14 sets per workout ensuring that i'm totaling anywhere from 8 to 30 sets per week for each muscle group. Smaller muscle groups might be towards the bottom end of that range. Bigger muscle groups might be towards the higher end of that range. Within the five to 30 rep range, training two, if not close to failure. And this kind of goes into common question of the week, actually. What is your favorite exercise for adding bulk slash volume to the quads? I'm gonna actually do you one further. I'm actually gonna give you a few of my favorite exercises. We're looking at my personal favorite exercises for the quads. The hack squat is definitely in there, 100%. I love a good hack squat. If you don't have a hack squat, you can certainly back squat instead. Again, probably more high bar focus with elevated heels like Olympic lifting shoes for the additional knee flexion. I've always 
already expressed my concerns with the back squat. When looking at quad hypertrophy, you can take the hack squat to failure more safely. Therefore, the hack squat might be better than the back squat for the quads. In addition to that, other areas might limit your ability to fully reach failure in the quads when looking at the back squat. Maybe breathing, your core. On top of that, I like a leg press again, a deep leg press with a low foot stance, narrow feet turned out. I like a rear foot elevated split squat. Again, I don't like it. I hate a split squat. You know I hate a split squat, but it's a bloody good and effective movement. What I would do again, because I'm trying to bias the quads a bit more, we would then implement a change to that movement that would allow us to increase knee flexion. So how much the knee is bending. By that, I mean I would elevate the heel of my working leg, which would be your front foot. Bump the heel up on a inch platform allows a bit more knee travel and knee flexion and when we are looking at how elevated that back heel is again i got this from jpg as well he recommends about six to eight inches you don't need to put it on a, a big bench behind you as sometimes that's too high and that's my final movement regarding favorite quad movements would definitely be a leg extension that's basically it hat squat or back squat if you can't hat squat leg press rear foot elevated split squats with the front heel elevated and leg extensions my favorite quad movements but again that is based on personal preference and personal preference alone you may have very different favorite quad movements and in fact i'd actually love to know what are your favorite quad movements drop them down below in the comment section and tell me because i'd love to hear them i'm not disrespecting erin in the slightest by stating her workouts bad or anything along those lines and i'm merely giving my input and opinion on what i like about it and what i would maybe change myself based on my preferences if you like the video please let me know you like the video by dropping a like on the video 1200 likes in the first 24 hours is the goal so if we reach that that'd be bloody splendid if you feel you managed to take something away from this or maybe even learn something from this video please consider clicking the red button down below and subscribing to the channel and maybe even clicking the bell next to it so you get notified when i upload every week twice a week and if you too have a question you want me to answer at the end of the next video drop it down below for comment question of the week and i shall do so thank you for tolerating me thank you for not laughing at how excessively large my head is or maybe even how excessively small this hat is and thank you for tolerating the video